Uh, thank you, Martin. So just a Q1 recap. Uh, Model Y became the best-selling vehicle of any kind in Europe uh, and the best-selling non-pickup vehicle in the United States. Um, and this is in spite of uh, a lot of challenges in production and delivery. So it's a huge credit to the Tesla team for um, deliver, uh, achieving these great results. Um, the, it, it is worth pointing out that the current macro environment uh, remains uncertain. Uh, I don't think I'm telling anyone they, any, anything people don't already know, um, especially with large purchases such as cars. And uh, while we reduced prices considerably in early Q1, um, it's worth noting that our operating margin remains among the best in the industry. Uh, we've taken a view that pushing for higher volumes and a larger fleet is the right choice here uh, versus a lower volume and uh, higher margin. Uh, however, we expect our vehicles over time will be able to generate a significant uh, profit through uh, autonomy. So we, we, we do believe we're like laying the groundwork here uh, and then it's better to ship uh, a large number of cars at a lower margin and subsequently um, uh, harvest that margin in the future as uh, we perfect autonomy. autonomy. This, this is an extremely important point. Um, let's see, regarding the Cybertruck, we continue to build alpha versions of the Cybertruck um, on our pilot line for testing purposes. It's, it's a great product um, and we're uh, completing the installation of the uh, volume production line at Giga Texas, and we're anticipating having a, a, a delivery event, a, big, a great delivery event, uh, probably in uh, Q3. Uh, uh, as with all new products, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll follow an S curve of, uh, you know, so production starts out slow and then accelerates. Um, so uh, the Cybertruck is no different. Um, so it's, it's you know, there's a tremendous amount of demand for the product, obviously. Uh, it, it is, in my view, a fantastic product, a Hall of Famer. Um, uh, but it, as with as with all uh, new products, it takes time to uh, get the manufacturing line going. And this is really a very radical product. It's not it's not made in, this, in the way that other cars are made. Um, so let's see, with regard to Megapack, we're making uh, great progress. Our energy storage deployment reached nearly four gigawatt hours in Q1. It's by far the strongest quarter ever. And this growth was achieved thanks to the ongoing ramp at our mega factory in Lathrop, California. Um, there's still some way to go to reach the full run rate of 40 gigawatt hours per year. Um, and then we additionally announced the start of a new mega factory uh, in Shanghai. So we were... Um, as, as we've um, uh, expected, the stationary storage growth actually will significantly exceed the vehicle growth. Um, regarding uh, autopilot and full self-driving, we've now crossed over 150 million miles driven by full self-driving beta, and this number is growing exponentially. We're, uh, I mean, this is a, a data advantage that really no one else has. Uh, those who understand uh, AI will understand the importance of data, of training data, um, and how fundamental that is to uh, achieving an incredible outcome. So, uh, yeah. So, um, we're also very, very focused on improving our neural net training capabilities, um, as it is one of the main limiting factors of achieving full autonomy. Um, so, we're continuing to to uh, simultaneously make uh, significant purchases of uh, NVIDIA GPUs uh, and also putting a lot of effort into Dojo, uh, which we believe has the potential for an order of magnitude improvement in the cost of training. Um, and it also Dojo also has the potential to become a sellable service uh, that we would offer to other companies in the same way that Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, offer, offers uh, more web services. <laughs> Um, even though it started out as, as a bookstore. So uh, I really think that, yeah, the dojo potential is, is very significant. Uh, in conclusion, we're taking a view that we want to keep making and selling as many cars as we can, um, despite this being an uncertain macro environment. Uh, this is a, a good time to increase our lead further, um, and we'll continue to in invest in growth as fast as possible. Uh, once again, I'd like to... Uh, Give a huge thanks to all Tesla employees worldwide 
for doing an incredible job again. And um, yeah, um, super appreciated. Thank you very much. And Zach has some remarks as well. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, I want to start by congratulating the Tesla team for record vehicle production and deliveries. And I also want to congratulate our energy storage team for record volumes as well. There's three main points I want to make. First, automotive gross margin and operating margin reduce sequentially, but as Elon mentioned, these remain at healthy levels. In particular, automotive gross margin was impacted by a few factors since our discussion on the last earnings call, which include additional action taken in the second half of the quarter to improve vehicle pricing, and one-time items, most notably warranty adjustments on older SNX vehicles, as well as increased deferred revenue for certain autopilot features as we transition technologies. Progress on vehicle cost reduction continued in Q1 with meaningful improvements on logistics and the beginnings of some commodity cost reductions starting to be realized. Per unit costs for Austin and Berlin improved as well, driven by record volumes. However, these factories still provide a margin headwind and will likely continue to do so until after we reach and stabilize at our intended volumes. Note that Q1 was our third quarter in our multi-quarter plan to move to a more regionally balanced mix of build and deliveries. As I've mentioned previously, this results in lower deliveries than production within a quarter due to a higher volume of cars in transit at the end of the quarter and has an associated impact on quarter ending free cash flows. This was particularly prevalent in Q1 for S and X as we begin exporting cars for international deliveries. Second, our storage business is starting to take shape and this is exciting to see after many years of investment and focus. This business is growing as a percentage of the businesses of the company's revenue and reached its highest level yet in Q1, driven by an increasing rate of deliveries for our Megapack products. We are also making progress on storage profitability, generating our highest gross profit yet in the quarter. Third, I want to reiterate the philosophy by which we are operating the business this year. Our approach is to grow volumes as quickly as possible in both our vehicle and energy businesses. We plan to continue to invest heavily into our future plans, which include the Cybertruck, next generation platform, in-house cell production, energy storage business, and our autonomy and AI enabled products. And we plan to do this while keeping the business financially healthy and industry leading. To accomplish this, we need to remain focused on cost efficiency and working capital, and in particular, unwinding the strategic inventory buildup left over from the pandemic. I want to conclude by thanking the Tesla team again, as well as thanking our suppliers and our customers. Thank you very much. And let's go to investor questions on say.com. Um, the first one is, what is the process to make auto pricing adjustments? What variables do you consider? How frequently do you review pricing? Do, do you want to take that, Elon, or do you want me to take it? My, my apologies, sorry, I was on mute. Um, uh, yeah, I think this is not something that we, we can really talk about. It's just uh, uh, we, we do our best to evaluate the, you know, the production output, macroeconomic conditions, and, and we make a decision. But it's, yeah, uh, unless it's something you'd like to add, Zach. No, I think that's right. I mean, as a team, we review where we stand globally on a weekly basis and certainly can't get into the details of the reasons why certain decisions are made. But it, it is something that's very actively managed by a subset of the leadership team. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, uh, do you still believe Tesla Energy will be bigger than auto? And when will you provide more formal guidance on Megapack and overall Tesla Energy? Yeah, I, sh I should just uh, clarify, like, big, bigger than auto from the standpoint of like total um, uh, gigawatt hours deployed. Um, so it's possible automotive revenue may be higher, but gigawatt hours, uh, I think, will be uh, probably higher with uh, stationary storage. If you just look at um, the what's needed to transition the world to a sustainable energy economy, uh, there is more stationary energy storage needed than there is mobile energy storage. So, uh, and and we we are seeing uh, growth of our stationary storage um, well in excess of automotive. So that. Um, is in line with expectations. Yeah, and on the, the guidance part of the question, and maybe Martin, we can combine this with the next question, which is on guidance for margins. 
um, just have a single comment there. You know, I, I think we are, we will get to the point where we as a company provide guidance um, on the storage business. I say storage is a combination of both the mega pack business and the power wall business. Uh, relative to total revenues of the company, it's still fairly small. And, um, and, and the business has a lot of volatility currently, both in terms of volumes as well as financials, just given uh, the small volumes and kind of diversification of the customer a pool there. But, but as this business grows and smooths out, I don't think we're that far away from it. Um, you know, I think including these volumes on our, our day two production and deliveries release is something that we'll start doing. Um, and then we can talk more formally as a business about our expectations over the coming year. I think it'll be a few more quarters before we get there. Thank you. Uh, the next question, as you said, uh, was already answered. So let's go to the battery question. Oh, sorry, just one other thing I wanted to mention on margin. Um, you know, while we're not providing specific guidance there, I mean, just to set expectations of where we think this business will go in terms of margins, you know, probably generally in the ballpark of what we've seen historically on the vehicle business. Um, you know, we, we generally look to mid 20% gross margins uh, for any program that we launch. And so we're, we're not there yet on this business, but that's where we're working towards. We're hopeful to get there later this year, but that's not a promise. That's an aspiration. Thank you. The next question is, how well are 4680 cells meeting the expectations described on the battery day? How long will it be until the cells meet those goals? True. <clears throat> yeah. So on, on battery day, we established a cost down roadmap through 2026 across five areas of effort. There was the cell design we discussed, um, anode and cathode materials, the structural pack concept, and the cell factory itself. And we've been making progress across all these aspects since then. Um, for the cell factory, the the Texas 4680 factory, we you know are partway through building and commissioning and installing and operating. Uh, will be 70% lower capex per gigawatt hour than typical cell factories when fully ramped in line with what we described on battery day. Um, and we're continuing to further pursue densification and investment reduction opportunities in future factory buildouts like in Nevada. Um, on the cell design, we're in production with not only the first generation tablet cell we unveiled on battery day, but a second more manufactured version in Texas today. On the cathode material side, we have a number of activities underway per the battery day roadmap uh, for lithium. Our Corpus Christi lithium refinery breaks ground uh, this May. Uh, our goal is to start commissioning portions of the facility for the, for the end of the year. Uh, the refinery uses the sulfate-free spodumene refining process with reduced process costs, no cast acid or caustic reagents, lower embodied energy, and actually produces a beneficial byproduct that can be repurposed in construction materials. We discussed all of these concepts on battery day. Um, same with cathode precursor, we've successfully just demonstrated a lower process cost, zero waste water precursor process uh, that we described on battery day at both lab and pilot scale and are in the detailed design phase for incorporating this technology into the front end of our Austin cathode facility. On cathode production, we are 50% equipment and 75% utilities installed uh, at our new cathode building in Austin uh, with our goal to begin dry and wet commissioning this quarter and next quarter with the target to produce first material before the end of the year. Um, structural pack. We saw big improvements with pack manufacturing with the 4680 cell in the structural pack concept, 50% lower capex and 66% smaller factory for the same output uh, in gigawatt hours per year. Um, you know, we're, we, we do believe structural as a, as a concept is a good one. It's simpler. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to structurally load the cells and use the pack as the floor of the vehicle while iterating the design to closer to B-level execution of this A-level architecture in future programs. Um, and zooming out for the 4680 team, Q1 was all about cost and quality. We made significant improvements in both areas. On uh, Texas, production increased 50% quarter over quarter. Through yields increased 12%, and Cato peak rate increased by 20%, and through yields improved by 20%. Altogether, the team accomplished a 25% reduction in COGS over the quarter, um, and we are on track to achieve steady state cost targets over the next 12 months. Um, and going forward for the rest of the year, the priority one is yielding cost for the 4680 program as we steadily ramp production ahead of Cybertruck next year. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, uh, what do you anticipate 2023 automotive gross margins X credits will be at the company's current pricing levels? 
Yeah, um, I, I can start off on this one. Um, you know, this is a difficult environment to make a projection like this. You know, there's a lot of macro uncertainty. Um, there's also headwinds and tailwinds. And, um, you know, this is basically a question I think that's asking about our viewpoint on where costs will go. And, and within costs, there's a set of costs in which we do control, a set of costs in which we're kind of subject to what's going on in the macro world. You know, within the bucket of things we control, you know, the, the, the most of the cost down that we're working on is around ramping our Austin factory, stabilizing that, um, and then doing the cost optimization work once we get to our intended volumes there. And, and a, a part of the cost journey in the Austin factory is, as Drew mentioned, the 4680 cell, which is an input into our Austin COGS. Uh, and so, um, you know, as the 4680 program improves over the course of the year on cost, as Drew mentioned, and then the non-cell portion of the factory improves, you know, we see a pretty good trajectory in the Austin facility. But a similar story exists in the Berlin factory. Um, it does not have 4680 as an input, but uh, for that factory, the journey to complete localization ha uh, is still ongoing. And so over the course of this year, as volume increases, um, uh, more localization occurs, you know, we do see a good path to cost reduction in the Berlin factory as well. Um, in existing factories, too, we talk about this on every call, so I don't need to rehash it, but, you know, the expectation is that every existing factory improves all of their key metrics, and we continue to see the progress there. Um, uh, you know, th there's, you know, there's also a handful of other costs in which we have influence, but, you know, the philosophy here is that we're aggressively going across every cost bucket that we can. Um, within the world that we don't control, you know, the two major costs there being logistics, which fortunately is moving in our favor. And I think our supply chain team has done a, a great job both on logistics optimization and taking advantage of, of reduced spot rates where they can. Uh, so thank you to our supply chain team. Um, and then there's the commodities world, which uh, has been a huge page point in our cost structure over the last, say, two years or so. And we're still kind of at the maximum of pain for commodities in our cost structure. Um, it kind of maximize, it maxed out in the second half of last year. We did start to see in Q1 a little bit of improvement. Um, we think there'll be a little bit more improvement in Q2. But, um, and the, the lithium has dropped a lot. It, it's worth mentioning yeah. that the price of lithium has dropped significantly. Yeah, and, and that's that's the piece that we expect to see more impact from in Q2. And, and generally, as a company, we do expect commodity prices to come down and have a more meaningful impact in the second half of the year. Yeah. So, you know, th this is our approach, how that nets out. I mean, just just a lot of, of risk and we'll have to see how the year progresses. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how has global order intake tracked since the most recent round of price cuts? I think the overall thing we can say is that uh, um, uh, orders are in excess of production. Thank you. Um, and maybe the last question from investors. Uh, can you give updated specs and pricing for Cybertruck and any new features that will make it to production? Well, I think we'll save uh, that for the uh, Cybertruck handover, which will hopefully be around the end of Q3 this year. Um, and I, I, one thing I, I, I am confident of saying is that it's an incredible product. Um, it's a Hall of Famer, I think. Um, and a, a product like this only comes along once once in a long while. So um, people will not be disappointed at all. It's amazing. Great, thank you very much. And let's go to uh, analyst questions. Uh, we'll start with Alex Potter from Piper Sandler. Uh, Alex, go ahead and unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so first question uh, was on Lathrop. Um, obviously, that's it's great to see the growth there. I'm just wondering uh, when you think that facility might be closer to full utilization? Um, are you just sort of deliberately working your way up the S curve there? I, demand obviously isn't the limitation. So what are what are the steps, I guess, to unlocking uh, full utilization there? Um, sure. There, there are some classic, you know, factory ramp 
aspects of what's going on in, in Lathrop. We actually have uh, two phases of the CapEx there. We phased um, some of the General Assembly uh, parts of the facility. Uh, but in addition, we also have ramps uh, with our suppliers that we are following. So both on the on the cell side and on the power electronic side. Um, and we will see that unlock um, in the latter half of this year with, with, with both of those inputs. So the, the, the overall facility was phased um, with the second phase of CapEx coming online towards the end of this year. Okay, great. And then um, I guess my second question is uh, on your ability to serve other markets out of Shanghai. Obviously, the, the facility in Berlin should be opening up your ability to, I guess, allocate more vehicles to Southeast Asia, Australia, other areas. I'm just wondering what other regions you think you're maybe not yet serving effectively uh, what are your timelines for addressing some of those gaps in your regional exposure? Thanks. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question because there, there are still many parts of the world that we do not uh, yet serve with respect to vehicles, especially. Um, so we we do expect to open up new markets around the world, um, and while those markets are not necessarily individually um, gigantic, they they do add up to you know if you add up a whole bunch of markets, they they do collectively um, sum up to something significant. So it's it's, it's high time that uh, Tesla operates cars um, to the rest of the world, and and that is something that we intend to do. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next analyst, uh, George from Canaccord. Uh, go ahead and unmute. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. I was wondering first if you could discuss uh, your FSD take rates and whether you've seen any significant positive or negative change there. And also, you know, given that you've reduced uh, the prices for your vehicles, uh, do you think you need to do that for FSD as well? Thanks. Um, well, I, I'll decline to answer the, the details on the FSD take rate, but the it, it's a tricky it's a tricky pricing question because the the value of a car that is autonomous is enormous. Um, so in a way, the you know the price right now is an option value on uh, on on an autonomous vehicle, um, and and that that value is that will, you know will ultimately be very very significant. And um, you know it's really really yeah. I mean for those that are that are using the FSD beta, I think you can see the the improvements are really quite dramatic. Um, you know there'll there'll be a little bit of uh, Two steps forward, one step back between releases, um, and for those trying the beta. But the the, the trend is very clearly towards full self driving, uh, towards full autonomy. And um, you know, <laughs> I I hesitate to say this, but I I think we'll do it this year. Um, so that's what it looks like. Um, yeah. Uh. Thank you. Uh, maybe on uh, the dramatic change uh, we've seen in EV-related commodity prices, uh, do you think that's a reflection of any recent overcapacity in mining and refining, or is that sort of a coincident indicator uh, on global EV demand? And how do you expect those prices to kind of track over the next several quarters? Thank you. Man, I wish I had a crystal ball to answer your question. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if we can provide a a question that would, um, with with that, that would have any uh, value really. It's I think we're 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 in uncertain times, and if somebody's got a crystal ball they can lend me, I'd I really like to borrow it. Um, but uh, you know these are just so happens, Elon. Um, you know my my guess is this: we're, it's you know economic stormy weather for about a year or so, um, and then. If we'll call it roughly 12 months, and, and then so this is my guess. I'm it's just pure speculation. Uh, stormy weather for about 12 months, and and then provided there are not no major geopolitical wild cards that 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 show up, um, that that is, things start getting sunny around spring next year. The only yeah, yeah the only thing I would say on the <clears throat> like uh, EV materials. Markets, they're not all super liquid. And some of them, for example, like less than like single digit percentage uh, of the market is actually traded on the spot market. So, uh, and 
they're not only are they not super liquid, there's not like storage isn't particularly facile for all of the materials. So uh, like small mismatches in supply and demand drive like large price swings, not not really real price swings, but just like temporarily large price swings. So it's hard to read into those price swings. I don't know, Karin, if you want yes. to add anything. Uh, well, but this is kind of by the way. Well, we, we are seeing, you know, as Elon mentioned, quite a bit of softening in the lithium carbonate market. Um, this was, you know, six months ago, we were trading at like $85,000 a ton. And, and today's spot price is about 26. So, so there's been a dramatic uh, decrease in that. Uh, of course, we were able to take advantage of uh, low lithium pricing earlier on with fixed price contracts. And we find that this is going to be another opportunity, opportune moment uh, to basically extend that uh, into the later half of the decade. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we at the quantities we're procuring, we're not as impacted by the spot market uh, because we have um, those contracts in place. And we're just going to be uh, going and doing more of that. The other thing that's happening is because of the price spike, um, a lot of the companies that are in this business are uh, becoming more ambitious about finding more upstream resources and exploring uh, locations in Africa as well as South America. Um, so that's that's also helping the, the macro situation with pricing. Yeah. Um, but, but just on, on the lithium front, to, to emphasize the, 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 the choke point is is more much more on refining capacity than it is on on mining. Lithium is actually is, is very common uh, throughout the world, uh, in, including in the U.S. and and really never ever. It's it's just a very common um, element on on Earth uh, is lithium. Um, so it's it's much more a question of where's the refining capacity, and can the refining capacity uh, keep up? That's that's really what what matters more than where it where is the uh, lithium ore. Um, it's everywhere basically. Um, the, the, I, I think that same uh, question also extends to refining of the uh, the, the, the cathode um, and to some degree refining of the anode. And this is why we've uh, at, at Tesla we're, we're building our you know lithium refinery capability uh, at Corpus Christi and uh, our cathode uh, refinery uh, outside of Austin. Um, no, it's worth noting. Like, I, 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 I hope other companies do do the same thing. <laughs> we will we, we'll have by far the most uh, lithium refining capability and the most uh, a cathode refining capability in North America. I think probably more than everyone else combined, by a lot. So, can can other people please do this work? That would be great. We're begging you. <laughs> we we don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, can someone please, like, instead of making a picture sharing app, please <laughs> refine <laughs> lithium mining and refining heavy industry. Come on, it's fun. It's actually fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's real. You have a yeah. customer. We're here, <laughs> ready yeah. to buy. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. It's, 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 Tesla's not doing this because we want to do it. We have a lot of. We, we have a lot of fish to fry, obviously, but we're doing it because others aren't doing it, and we wish others would do it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Let's go to Emmanuel Rossner from Deutsche Bank. Hey, Emmanuel, can, hey, you, can hear you hear us? me? Yeah, we can. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much for taking my questions. Uh, maybe your first question for Ilan on your pricing strategy. So if I understand your message, you're saying, uh, you know, Tesla feels it's worth maximizing the volume, increasing the size of the fleet um, as, as fast as you can, because you'll be able to monetize this over the, the life cycle of the vehicle. Can you be a little bit more specific around ways you would be able to monetize sort of like this existing fleet um, in the future? Uh, obviously, I think autonomous seems to be a big piece of it. By my, my understanding was that robotaxi would probably be for the next generation vehicle, not not the existing one. So, I guess uh, it, in which ways would you monetize it? Sorry, the, the robot taxi terminology can be a bit confusing uh, because that that's sort of like a generic term for our next generation uh, vehicle. Um, and we obviously are working on next generation vehicle. It's going to be very compelling. This is just not the time to talk uh, about it in details. Of product. Um, so we, we 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 internally call it. Robo taxi, <laughs> but 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 really all of the vehicles that have hardware three, which is the vast majority of our fleet, we believe will achieve full autonomy. So they will be robot. They will be a a rob like a model three or model Y would be a robo taxi. 
um, a robotic taxi. Um, so yeah, that that's to, to the best of my knowledge that we we, we believe the, the current hardware can achieve full autonomy. Understood. Um, and then maybe a question for Zach uh, back on the um, automotive gross margin. So I think I guess. Uh, a few months ago, uh, you know, even after major price cuts, you felt pretty strongly that, uh, you know, 20% automotive gross margin was still, you know, probably a, a reasonable floor. Obviously, the macro has, you know, gone worse and additional price cuts have, have happened. Is is there anything else that has changed in terms of the outlook? Is it just the macro deteriorating? Is it the competitive landscape? Anything else that sort of like uh, makes you think differently around, you know, the full year? And is there... Is there a way, therefore, to uh, to frame a floor? Yeah, um, you know about you know it, about half of the miss against that uh, previous conversation last quarter is attributed to adjustments we made in pricing in the second half of the quarter. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue that that lowers the floor in a sense. Um, we've also made pricing adjustments so far this quarter. You know, so that brings brings it down further. Um, about the other half of the miss in Q1 was uh, attributed to things that are non non recurring. Uh, so I mentioned these in my opening remarks. Uh, uh, it's a warranty adjustment for cars that were previously produced, but not part of the pedigree of cars we're building now, and um, and some uh, autopilot related deferrals as we make some technology changes here that. Those deferrals should get recognized once uh, some of the software catches up. So th those two things are non-repeating. So ho hopefully that helps answer your question. Yeah, I mean, th there's there's really two uh, macro factors that are that are tricky. Um, uh, the the biggest being the 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 interest rate. So if the, if the if there's a very high Fed rate or interest rates are very high, that um, that that is you know, every time that the Fed raises interest rates, that's that's equivalent to increasing the, the price of a car. Um, it makes the, the cars less affordable because people uh, are able to buy cars as a function of what they can afford on a monthly basis. Um, so um, that that's that. So, so it's just it, almost directly equivalent to a, a price increase is any kind of interest rate increase. Um, they, then the other factor is whenever there's uncertainty in the economy, uh, people uh, will generally postpone. Um, New, uh, you know, new, new, big, new capital purchases like a new car. Um, this is a natural human reaction. Um, so, you know, if, if if people are reading about layoffs and whatnot in the press, they're like, well, they might be worried about they might be laid off. So, then they'll be naturally a little more hesitant than they would otherwise be to um, buy a new car. Uh, now, now this this is just the nature of the auto industry. Uh, um, you know, it. it uh, but, but the, the, there is, there will be a tremendous amount of pent up demand for new cars. So, um, but it goes through cycles. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Ben Kalo from Baird. Ben, go ahead and unmute. Hey guys. Um, you know, what, uh, Elon, when you talk about many fish to fry, you talked about Dojo being a, a, a product that you can sell outside of Tesla. How do we uh, how do we rank you know, all the things you have going on and then in the economic environment? I, I mean, like heat pumps and um, everything else that you have going on versus um, the, you know, uh, investing in the, the vehicle business. Or is that, that not the right way to look at it? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but the the you know I'd, I'd look at Dojo as like uh, kind of a long shot bet. But if it's a long shot bet that pays off, it'll pay off in a very, very big way. Um, but potentially, you know, yeah, potentially in a very, very big way. Like, you know, um, in the in the multi hundred billion dollar level. It, it, but it, but the thing with like, you know, still put it in the long shot category, but long shot with a multi hundred billion dollar, you know, potential outcome. And uh, so, so it's a bet worth making, um, but not one you can take. You, you can sort of say like, oh, you know, take it to the bank type of thing. <laughs> Although these days, take it to the bank, <laughs> it's maybe not as <laughs> as secure as it used to be. Um, 
So, um, and obviously we're big believers. Um, and that is on our, on our list that, you know, over time is to do a really good uh, heat pump for homes and, you know, commercial offices and stuff. And we have the technology, it's really good. Um, but it's it's still it's it's a back burner item. Um, uh, you know, our focus is very much on on vehicles, autonomy, stationary storage, basically as solving sustainable energy um, and solving uh, autonomy, which would be uh, a trim. You know, like I says, solving autonomy. If 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 we're able to have a fleet of several million vehicles that, with a software update, uh, can ha can be potentially worth several times their original value that's that, that that will be if that happens that will be the and i think it will happen um that'll be the biggest uh, asset value increase in history i think thank you bob we, uh, just on pricing uh, a lot of pundits talk about the uh, pie and losing share or gaining share and uh but how do you guys look at pricing versus the evs or the ice vehicles or does that not come into the equation uh, sorry to ask about pricing again thank you no and it, it's really just like you know we're every day we get um, a, a daily real-time update of how many cars were ordered yesterday how many cars were produced yesterday we must have a if, if there's a company that's got more real-time data than than tesla I'd, I'd, you know i'm not sure i'm not sure there's any company on earth that has better real-time data than than Tesla, except maybe SpaceX, Starlink, you know. So, because um, because like we don't have to, you know, for the other car companies, they will uh, make the cars, send them to the dealers, then the dealers will sell the cars, and you know, and then it takes quite a long time for them to get the data back to actually figure out how many cars were sold. Um, whereas we know how many cars were ordered yesterday uh, throughout the world. Um, so, so our fingers on the pulse is, is real time and does not have latency, whereas the other uh, car companies have a lot of latency in their data, as does the government. The government has a lot of latency in, in their data. So, so we're just looking at and saying, okay, um, you know, what, what, what does it uh, take to achieve a clearing price for our vehicle production? Um, and then we, we make a pricing change and we see what happens immediately. Um, and adjust course. So we're adjusting course and we're thinking about it literally every day, seven days a week. Um, every seven days a week, I look at that email and so does the rest of the team. And um, we, we, we try to make the least dumb decision that we can. Um, you know, and on balance, I think our decisions are pretty good. Um, you know, sometimes they'll be, you know, dumb, but on average, they're, I think, better than the rest of industry. Just, just to add on the question about EV market share or ICE, um, th this comes up a lot. I think a lot of the public debate is around this concept of EV market share. You know, we don't look at it that way. I mean, we look at yeah. it as market <laughs> share of cars. It's, it's yeah. the car market, not the EV yeah, market. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the mission of the company requires internal combustion engine cars to be switched over to electric vehicles. So that's what we pay attention to. Yeah, and yeah, I've said that last time too. You just we got to, you guys got to stop looking at it as the EV B E V market. It's how many cars are we selling? Just start looking at it that way. Please. All all cars, all cars will be EVs. It's uh, you know, it's gonna, you know, I've said this for a long time. But we'll look back. I don't know. Assuming civilization's still around in twenty years, um, the we'll look back on internal combustion engine vehicles the same way we look back on external combustion engine vehicles, which like a steam engine. A steam engine is an external combustion engine vehicle. And, you know, there's still a few around. They're kind of quirky and, you know, kind of cool collector's items. Uh, that's that's how gasoline cars will be in the future. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Colin Rush from Oppenheimer. Colin, go ahead, go ahead and unmute, please. Thanks so much, guys. Can you talk a little bit about how much of the, the actual cost structure is variable, um, you know, on, on these vehicles? And if you could give us a range on plus or minus the, the lithium cost within those contracted volumes uh, that, that you're seeing. Uh, well, I think you have to, uh, I'll, I'll, 
again, you, we'd really love to have a crystal ball here, uh, but we don't have it. Um, it, it, it depending on what time scale you're looking at, um, the, the, most of the car is variable. Um, so uh, most, like most of the car costs variable. So, and probably, if I were to guess, I, I think we will see improved costs from suppliers. Um, you know, um, yeah, I, I think we will. Yeah. That, 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 that is our expectation. Yeah, and, and we're already starting to see that. Uh, Elon, I think you know, you'd mentioned before that we anticipated a crash in the lithium prices. And, and some of that has flowed through by way of lithium carbonate reductions uh, into battery cost. Um, and the same thing will happen with lithium hydroxide. The length of the supply chain matters also. Because what we're talking about is is very far upstream. So that by the time it you know makes yeah, it into the battery exactly. that's up in a car, it'll be several months. But you know beyond just the commodity pricing, as Zach mentioned earlier, we're also very focused on other metrics that make production very efficient. So for example, detention and demerge, uh, air expedites. Uh, I think our air expedites are down 90 percent. Detention and demerge is down 93 percent uh, from the peaks. That's that can be hundreds of thousands of dollars per vehicle. So we're sort of attacking all vectors uh, and and becoming very efficient. Okay, um, and, and then my follow-up is really around um, stationary storage demand on the utility scale. I mean, obviously there's a gigantic queue uh, for you know interconnection in the U.S. And can you talk about you know the, the volume of quotation you're seeing at this point around you know, stationary storage uh, for that renewables queue on, on a global basis, and and how how much of that is converting into actual sales? Drew, you want to take a? Um, I mean, it, yeah, I, I don't. That's also not exactly how we we look at it, really. Um, we're not like, yeah, we're not engaged in the interconnection queue. Like, we're focused on ramping Megapack as as quickly and efficiently as we can, and we have, you know, visibility into the pipelines of you know a variety of different renewable energy and and just pure stationary storage developers, and we also develop our own projects, and we're we're mostly just. Going, we're being selective and trying to pick the products that projects that best fit our mission and our objectives. Yeah, this again, this is not a product call, but we will have something. I mean, this, we're making improvements on on on, on many fronts, including Meg, Megpack. So, I think some of those improvements will uh, improve the speed at which you can connect the Megapacks to the grid. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mark Delaney from Goldman Sachs. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. Um, do you still see 2 million units as an upside case for volume this year? And is the gating factor for reaching 1.8 million or 2 million units in 2023 still supply chain, as was mentioned on your last conference call, or is it more about demand at this point? Well, you know, if, if, if you have a crystal ball, you can lend me back to the crystal ball situation. Um, uh, these are volatile times. Um, from a production standpoint, if things go well, we've got a shot at 2 million vehicles this year. Um, but that is the upside case. Uh, and uh, we feel comfortable with 1.8. Um, and uh, we'll have to see how this, this year unfolds. That's helpful. Thanks. And then the company had spoken at the Investor Day and then some of the past conference calls about uh, opening up its vehicle charging network. Can you speak to some of the feedback you've been getting from both uh, Tesla owners and non-Tesla owners and uh, how the uh, the ramp of the uh, charging network may uh, progress from here? Thanks. Uh, Drew, you want to take that? Um, yeah. So as as you may have seen, we opened our first V4, uh, V4 posts in Europe and and um, and our Magic Dock posts in, in North America in Q1. Um, and that is, you know, indicative of the direction we're heading with, you know, universal compatibility for all vehicles, of, you know, no matter where the charge port is, et cetera, uh, in all major markets. And we're going to continue to roll out uh, those sort of improved offerings as we build new stations. Um, we, you know, we, we're always balancing like our ability to serve our own customers with our ability to serve new customers when doing that. Um, I think we've been able to balance it rather well for example in europe 50 percent of all of our of our supercharging stations are open to all evs um and we've been able to do that without any increase in wait times at all for anybody so we're, we're going to continue to take a similar approach as we do this in 
North America and China over the coming quarters. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Rod Lash from Wolf Research. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to first just follow up on your comments in your letter about leveraging your cost position as others struggle with unit economics and also taking into account the lifetime revenue. Uh, actually, in a way that most other automakers will, will never see, uh, just given your service network and supercharging and, and other attributes. Can you just maybe give us a sense of how far you'd be willing to take this? Are, are there brackets around the uh, range of initial margin that you'd be comfortable with? And uh, and again, any any color that you might provide on the updated range of margins that you'd expect in the in the auto business? I think we may have answered this question or tried to answer this question a few times, but uh, it, it's it's difficult to say what the the margin will be. Um, it depends on how, on what if, if what the macroeconomic environment is is like, you know. So, um, you know, for for example, if if the Fed were to lower the rates, uh, that would be super helpful for demand. Um, if they keep, if they raise them, that's that's you know it's, that that just raises the interest cost that buyers have to pay for to buy a car, so it reduces affordability and re therefore reduces demand. Um, uh, so it's, but if, 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 you know, like if we look past say this year or we're like could go, you know, sometime next year, or middle of next year or something, I think things are looking really, I think, you know, like I said, well, you know, we'll best throw if, the, if there's some, you know, major geopolitical wild card that, that turns up. But in the absence of that, I think, I would be very optimistic about uh, your middle of next year and the next year. Yeah, and just to, so sorry, just to add Elon's comments, um, just two other points. You know, what, what what's really important for us this year, in addition to just managing the day-to-day -day of the business, but is also investing in, as Elon mentions, what 2024 and 2025 will look like. And so, you know, using the cash generated from the sale of products today and reinvesting that, this is very important for us. And I, I think that what happens to margins over the next couple of quarters only matters in the context of, of what that means for our ability to reinvest into 2024 and 2025. And, and we have a lot of space um, before that becomes something that we have to revisit our investment plans. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're planning to keep the business healthy but I, I just want to caution folks about reading too much into what happens over the near term here, because we're very focused as a company on making sure that when we exit this macroeconomic situation, this company is positioned in the best possible way. Yeah, exactly. Just uh, to elaborate on on that point, though, the, the revenue, the long term lifetime revenue that you're targeting from each vehicle is massive. So if you took that to the extreme, you'd, it would seem that you'd be comfortable with a relatively low initial margin. Am, am I Correct. misinterpreting that, or is that that exactly right? And and just that is exactly um, right. Okay. And the um, normally in in uh, in a recession when consumers feel less financially secure, actually price elasticity deteriorates. Just based on your pulse taking of the consumer, do you have a view on uh, elasticity of demand? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, I can't emphasize enough the, the, the whole just fundamental question of affordability. Um, for, the, for most people, the, the, their ability to buy a car is a function of, of can they make the monthly payment or not. Um, and, you know, so like I said, if, if, if interest rates are really high like they are right now, um, then um, you know, in, in, in some cases, people can't get a loan at all. You know, so it, it's it's a, uh, and <laughs> I think probably banks are are, are pretty, uh, you know, not not leaning forward in providing loans. I I, I expect these days. So, uh, you know, so that that's, but but, but like the, the, the there there is there is a quite a powerful story here when you 
uh, you know, going back to something I was alluded to a moment ago, um, or mentioned a moment ago, that Tesla is in a uniquely strong strategic position. Um, because we're the only ones making cars that technically we could sell for zero profit um, for now and then yield actually tremendous economics in the future, but no, through autonomy. No one else can do that. I, I'm not sure how many of you will appreciate the profundity of what I've just said, but it is extremely significant. Thank you. Let's go to Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so first, Elon, good luck with tomorrow's launch at Boca Chica. Break Thanks. a leg. We definitely uh, can't have too much luck in the rocket business, that's for sure. That's <laughs> incredible. Um, so now that you've gotten to know the Twitter architecture, kind of intimately oh, well <laughs> over the past six months. Uh, what can you tell Tesla stakeholders about how an X.com or super app could be potentially accelerative to Tesla's business model? Uh, well, I don't know. I guess it could make it potentially make it easier to buy cars. Um, so, but we are, we are straying somewhat off topic here because uh, this is okay. Tesla All right, but, 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 you know, let's do I think it. there's some benefit. I think probably there's some benefit. Yeah, let's. Sure. Let's. I get it, Elon. Um, so just as a follow up on manufacturing, I, I, you're a student of history, and yes. you'll know that back uh, in 1913, Henry Ford introduced the moving assembly line in Highland Park, Michigan, and the price of a Model T, which had already, you know been undercutting cars around the time fell another 70 or 80 percent and hundreds of rival car companies went bust yeah uh, i'm wondering if if history is repeating itself here elon and that the recent pattern of cuts with you is way ahead of the cost curve compared to competition or is this it seems like it's a calculated strategy not not just not just in reaction to competition or changing supply demand in the market but you're you know, could we could we catalyze some Darwinian forces in the EV market? Well, I mean, we're we're not trying to say take take pricing actions in order to be deliberately uh, to deliberately undermine competitors or anything like that. We, we we really don't think about competitors that much. We just look at, you know, do people like our cars? How can we make the product better? Uh, can they afford our cars? Um, and uh, you know, the sort of the things like improving service and and whatnot um but but like i said we, we do have this uh unique strategic advantage that that we have an we're making a, a car that uh if autonomy pans out and we think it will um where that that asset is actually will, will be worth a hell of a lot more in the future than it is now so it is technically possible to sell it at zero profit but still have the net present value of future cash flows associated with that asset be very significant. Yeah. And service and charging and insurance and all of these other ongoing revenue streams that other companies don't have. Yeah. C certainly we want all EVs to succeed too. We just want to say that we're not in like some malicious attacks to try to just crush yeah, right. everybody. <laughs> Definitely not. We're, we're, we're like opening up uh, superchargers. We've made our patents available for free. So it's like, we're trying to be helpful here, you know? So um, it, we're, we're not trying to, we're not out to, to just destroy competitors or anything like that. We're trying to help competitors, frankly, um, in any way that we can. Uh, thank you. Let's go to Dan Levi for, from Barclays. Hi, uh, good good evening, thank you. Um, first question, uh, you're ramping supply at, at Austin and Berlin, so I wanted to understand just how critical it is to further increase volume at those plants just to get the vertical integration benefits in the face of the sort of market with some demand questions. And just broadly, should we generally, I mean, historically you've been operating at the pace at which your supply allows you to produce as opposed to gauging to demand. Should we generally uh, expect that you're going to continue to produce at your whatever the max capacity that you're allowed within your supply constraints 
regardless of what the broader economic environment is, just to continue to get that volume out there? That That, that is... Yes, I mean, there's, there, there could be like obviously a, a macro shock that is so severe that you know people just stop buying cars for for some reason. Um, but in the absence of that, um, we will continue to grow uh, output at a rapid clip. Great, thank you. And then um, just on the the margins associated with Austin and Berlin, you you mentioned Austin and Berlin have a margin drag until you reach intended volumes. I don't know if you can disclose what those volumes are. Then maybe you could just remind us of what the margin profile of Austin and Berlin will look like versus Shanghai once you get uh, the vertical integration benefits in place. Well, probably won't have be quite as good as as Shanghai. Shanghai is hard to you know has has a very efficient cost structure. Um, obviously, our lowest cost structure in the world, um, but uh, we we do expect to be. Uh, make, make significant improvements in uh, Austin and Berlin um, and continue to uh, make improvements in Fremont as well. So, um, yeah. yeah we've, we've increased, this is Roshan, by the way, we've increased our localization efforts. So that will then drive down uh, our days and on hand requirements. We've made 10% quarter or quarter, in, you know, uh, improvement in days and on hand. Uh, so we'll continue that path as the localization uh, improves. Okay, thank you very much. And our final question comes from Philippe Couchois from Jefferies. Um, yes, good evening. Thanks for taking the question. Um, it's slightly longer term. I, I completely agree with your comments that we should look at Tesla in terms of you know, auto market share, not EV market share. But I, I'm just wondering, as you build up the market share globally, is there a limit to the direct selling business model as you practice it? And should we think about going forward, you need to look into the agency or using importers to basically develop market share more smoothly, I guess, um, globally. And so in other words, you know, is there kind of a, 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 a fell by date for the, the direct business model as you, as you practice it today? Uh, it seems to be working well so far. Um, because we, we, we hear different feedback from customers who miss the human interaction or unhappy with the service. And I'm just wondering if uh, if you're seeing some growth pains in there that would lead you to change. You're not you're not seeing that. Well, I mean, there are since, since we, we, we're always going to have some growing pains where, you know, at times and it depends on which geography we're, you know, we're talking about where sometimes service is behind sales, sometimes it's ahead of sales. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, I mean, Tesla is growing, I, I believe, faster than any company in history mm -hmm. that has that has that makes a large, complex manufactured object. So, um, you know, there's, it, these are if you're, if you're trying to max. It, it's diff always difficult to match exponentials. Um, so, uh, but but I think it is helpful to have the feedback loop with with a service because that means we feel the pain of of service and 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 then we can. Uh, ch adjust the design to make the car need less service, um, and I think that gives us a the the right incentive structure. Um, like because the, the the best service is no service, the car doesn't break. Um, and you know, whereas if you have say a dealer network that is reliant upon service as a revenue, then you arguably have a misalignment of incentives uh, where they, they you know. They're making money on service, but actually, we want to. You know, the, the best thing for the consumer is the car doesn't need servicing. So, yeah, and uh, and on that front, if I can follow up, have you have you worked out? I mean, for many of your traditional competitors, a, a fair amount of profits for them comes from selling spare parts and servicing. And you don't have that in your in your profit structure. And have you have you oh, worked out yeah, how much yeah. of a deficit you have compared to your peers? Yeah, actually, um, I mean, this one uh, something I could wax on about for a while because <clears throat> really people didn't uh, understand that the, the best short selling argument against Tesla for the longest time was the fact that Tesla does not have an existing fleet um, and that the auto industry, the reason incumbents uh, succeed and newcomers fail 
uh, the biggest reason is that the incumbents have a large fleet and they're able to sell new cars at close to zero margin um, and then sell spare parts at a, a very high margin, sort of, you know, razors and blades type thing. Um, and so the only way to actually succeed, uh, in a, for a newcomer to succeed, is to have a product that is so compelling that people are willing to pay a premium um, over the incumbent product. Um, and in the absence of electrification and autonomy, I don't think a newcomer can succeed. Thank you very much, everyone. Unfortunately, that's all, all the time we have uh, for this quarter. Uh, we'll see you again in three months from now. Thank you.